This is Bill Moberly with the Americans in Wartime Museum. I'm conducting an interview with Philip Fiumara, Fiumara on the 22nd of February at the Marriott Hotel in Crystal City, Virginia. So Phil, give me a little background on where you're from and, and uh, how you found yourself in the military. I'm from uh, Pittsburgh, PA. I was born in Pittsburgh, born and raised there most of my life. Uh, my, my father and my mother met in um, New York, moved to Pittsburgh, and my dad was an iron worker, and before that he was in World War II, he was in the Army Air Corps. And so, um, so I was born there, and uh, through the years I found out I was a really good artist, so, and I was a really good athlete too. I was on the swimming team in the city of Pittsburgh. I was one of the fastest swimmers in the city of Pittsburgh. And um, I could throw a baseball uh, almost the length of a football field. Uh, probably even further, and um, but I had dyslexia, and it hurt me through school. But I was pretty intelligent as far as creativity. I knew how to design a lot of things and do things like that. And as time went on, uh, in the years, I start writing proposals and different things like that. And so when I got to the point uh, when the Vietnam War was on, I was in high school. And a lot of the guys, uh, people that were in school with me, uh, because their families worked in the mills and that, there was a lot of people from the mills went uh, to Vietnam. So I, I decided to enlist because I wanted to go in law enforcement. So I signed up for, uh, to be an MP. Uh, but once I uh, got in the military, uh, I couldn't get my, uh, the school I wanted to get, and they told me, uh, so they reneged my contract uh, going into military. So instead I had to pick another, in basic training, I had to pick another uh, avenue of, uh, you know, something that I knew that I was good at. So I went into carpenter school and I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri uh, and became one of the top uh, carpenters. Out of a thousand points, I had 919 points. and. Um, I was, like I said, I was a pretty good athlete, so we had to run 150 yards with somebody on our shoulders, and I was about 180, 190 pounds. The guy that was on my shoulders was about um, 220 pounds. He was almost 40 pounds over my weight, and I ran uh, 100 yards in 19.9 seconds. A lot of people don't believe that, but I didn't put him on my back. I laid him across my shoulders, and so I used his weight to push me forward. and. Um, and so uh, after I got out of school, I graduated from there. And then my brother, my younger brother, a year younger than me, came in through the same school. <laughs> and um, oh yeah, before that, we had a guy in, in our company that was stealing stuff. And so my last hat was gone. And we had to go up to the linen line outside. And we had the old double uh, story buildings with the old wooden floors and the bay bunks and all that. And so my last hat was missing and it was raining a little bit and I went up to the linen line and I went up to him because people suspected him as taking this stuff. So I went over and I lifted his hat up and I looked inside and my name was in there. So I just grabbed him by the back of his shirt and drug him all the way down to the barracks and everybody in the line came down with us. And I kind of threw him around the room a little bit and then I opened his locker and all this equipment fell out. And so the first sergeant called me in his office and he asked me what happened. And I said, well, this guy, he must be a kleptomaniac or something. He's stealing everybody's equipment. I don't know what he's doing with it. And so he said, well, we just have to say he fell down the steps or something like that. And that was the end of that. But then, like I said, my brother came into that class and they, when he came in there, they said, don't, do you have a brother named Philip? He says, yeah. He says, they said, he's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, but I, uh, I was set on job assignments by myself a lot of times because I knew a lot about construction and development and design and all that because I was one of the top artists in the city of Pittsburgh. I helped start the graphic arts department. And um, my last year there, I went call uh, first prize for the first three color silk screen ever performed in the Pittsburgh public uh, schools. And then uh, my teacher, 
he went from pit shop to graphic design, so we went over to a vacational building. And I even did the Panther for Human Relations. I did it like a collage of all these different people from all these different countries. And then she came over to ask the, our teacher who, who did the book for her. And he said, uh, this young man, did, uh, and the teacher turned around and she started crying. She said, we never had anything like that before. So that was pretty moving. And um, so then uh, after, I, after I was in the military, after I went to carpenter school, uh, they sent me up to Fort Lewis. So they put me in three th uh, 30 nice engineers. While I was there, one day uh, they sent me to uh, Fort McCord Air Force Base. And there was a hangar there, and one of the big planes were right next to the hangar. It, it was like actually like one of the storage rooms. And we had to roll out these big barrels of 55-gallon uh, drums and put them on the planes. And they were about 300 pounds apiece, but I didn't want to roll them up the ramp because it was too hard, so I just picked them up and put them on the plane. Uh, that's how strong I was. And um, here I found out later that was Agent Orange. They were sending overseas. And so I was exposed to Agent Orange, and I'm on the Agent Orange register, but they're not honoring the conditions I received. The one that I just came up with uh, diabetes. I had diabetes before, and I had some other conditions. I have a prostate problem and different things like that. And like, I don't, I don't look at maybe, but I've had about 35 surgeries already, four lower back surgeries. I had seven surgeries on my left hand, including two corporal tunnels, uh, seven surgeries on my right hand. Uh, I mean, six surgeries on my right hand, except for my uh, index finger. And I had two corporal tunnels, alternate surgeries on both of my elbows, uh, my AC joint uh, on my right shoulder, um, and then my left shoulder, I had three tears, bone spurs, and a detached muscle. And I still have a detached muscle on my right arm. But I was always really strong. I mean, super strong, super, I mean, big, stronger than a lot of guys that are, are, are bigger than me even. Like, you know, and I knew how to handle myself too. I didn't like fighting, but I knew how to put, uh, I knew some tactics to put people down pretty quick. Uh, so whenever anybody came at me, um, you know, I knew how to uh, put them in a put them in a position where they uh, I made them just stop doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't like to hit people either, but I knew I knew how to use my hands as far as boxing and all that real good. Uh, so so then after that, I was in there in 339th Engineers. We we played some organized football, and um, I could knock guys down that were. 250 pounds with one arm. I just pick them up with one arm and just, uh, and so we, we, we did some organized football there, but no one knew how to pass the ball too good. I could throw the ball, but I couldn't play two positions at once. I couldn't throw the ball down the field and catch it because I was a really good receiver. And so after that, they sent me to 18th MP Company at the prison, and it was pretty new barracks and stuff, and the prison was new. I was not a shotgun guard. I had a whole carpenter shop. I would say it involved almost uh, 50, 60 acres, if, if not more. And I had one shop that had a big uh, table saw, had all kind of tools, and then I had a shed that had a ready arm saw that was 5,500 RPM. So I made all the mess cabinets for all the mess trucks. So then they had the, uh, <clears throat> they had the, uh, um, prisoners come down. Every time uh, the prisoners come down, they had to have a shotgun guard. So if there's three prisoners, there was one shotgun guard. If there was um, more than three, there was two shotgun guards, one on each side of them. And they, I was in a gated uh, area, and so nobody was allowed down there except for people that worked at the prison. And so, uh, so what I'd start doing, I start given the, these prisoners, I had to log everybody in the book who came down and, and uh, I had this big uh, book that I had in my office because uh, I kind of took over for the sergeant. I don't know what happened to the sergeant. After I got there, he told me what to do and I, had, I was doing mostly everything. Mm -hmm. So I did all that. So then, um, um, so then uh, I had a lieutenant come down to me one day and uh, he said to me, he said, Private, I need 10 sheets of plywood. I said, well, yes, sir. 
I says, do you have a work permit? And he says, uh, private, don't you see that bar on my shoulder? I says, yes, sir. I says, didn't you see the unauthorized sign up at the gate, at the front of the gate? And so he got pretty mad and left. And next thing I know, in about a week or a couple of days later, the major who was in charge of the MPs and the prison calls me up to the prison. And then he starts taking me on a, a tour of the prison. And then he takes me to the one room. And when you open the door, there was like a desk right there, about four feet or so, five feet from the opening of the door. And he says, we have a problem. We have clerks in this room, clerks on the other room. And all the incoming and outgoing prisoners had to go through the same rooms. And so he says, I want to try to avoid that so there's no mix up. So they usually had a, an, a prison guard with them when they went through that area. And uh, so what I did, I cut the front door into a Dutch door. I put a, 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 a platform on the top of that door, which left the top of the door open all the time. So when you came to the door and the clerk would come to the uh, counter in front and the door that was in the middle room, I moved it all the way up to the front. So when you open the door, the bottom part of the door, it opened and closed you in that one area. And so, uh, so then you either went this, you went to the right or you went to the left. So nobody had, to, all the prisoners didn't have to go through the same room any longer. They either went to the left or to, I mean, uh, yeah, to the left or to the right. And so I saw the big problems that a, the major wrote all kind of stuff in there. And, and then I had to do like the generals on the base. They sent me, they had diplomats coming on the base. So they asked me to make some horses out of logs. So I made about six horses. And, um, and also I had to do a picture frame was made out of oak and I was sanding the picture frame. And as I was sliding my hand down, a splinter about the size of a toothpick I went through my uh, small finger and ricocheted off the bone, went through my ring finger and went in through my ring finger and, and I mean my, uh, my big finger and stuck my three fingers together. So before I, I uh, went to the MPs, we had to build a medical dispensary and it was like an erector set. And when they, when they built the platform, the cement base of there, they never squared it. So the measurements were right, the length and the width were right, but they never squared it. So we had two inches on one side and six inches on the other corner. So it should have been a four inch perimeter all around and that building was supposed to be tapped into there. And then they, I'm pretty good at seeing and figuring out how things go together without even having directions. So they kept saying, what are these bands for? What are these bands for? And the bands were two long bands, and they had a hole in the middle and a hole at each end. And I looked at the top of the corners, and there was a threaded uh, bolt that's uh, sticking up on each corner. And so I figured that's what happened. That's the thing that held that building together, and it crisscrossed. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that squared it off, too. And so, and in the middle where the hole was, you had to bolt that in the middle. So that kept that... And then they put the roofing. I did all the windows. We had to putty all the windows. Nobody had to do that. I did all that stuff before I even went in the military. And so, uh, so I had all these write-ups about all the stuff I was doing. And then uh, every time I went to a different base, so then I went to Colorado. I was out in Colorado, and I was out there for a year and a half. And we, a lot of guys coming back from Vietnam were in really bad shape, mentally, uh, some of them were physically, uh, I, I met one guy, I remember talking to him about uh, his injuries and um, he, he got, he got uh, I don't know how to say it, but in his private area, he got hit uh, with some kind of explosive device and he lost certain parts of his anatomy. And because of that, um, he didn't know what to do and I says, I just talked to one day, and I don't know why, but I always meet uh, people that have problems like this. And I, I said, well, the only thing I can tell you is that you're alive, and you can only try to do the best you can. I mean, what else are you going to do? I said, I don't know what I would do in that case or anything like that. I'm sure there's a lot of people, but, you know, 
Uh, at least you're alive when a lot of veterans died over in Vietnam. And so what we did, uh, they had this hotel, it was called the Broadmoor Hotel. So we used to go and rent horses, and for $10 a day, you can take a horse without any guides and go up to the mountains. So a friend of mine, before I went in, used to work at a stable, and they used to have horseback riding there, so I knew how to ride horses pretty good. Uh, and so my ha horse that I had, I always got the same horse, he was 15, 17 and a half hands high. His back shoulder was actually over six foot. And um, so there was a big uh, level field that was a big grassy field, and we would race across there. My horse would always beat everybody. And so then after we got to where we started to go up the steeper inclines of the, uh, the mountain, there was a nice little stream there. It was a picnic area, had picnic benches. We'd sit down and have a sandwich, take the saddles and everything off the horses, let them rest a little bit and go up the mountains. When we come down the mountain, we did the same thing. And, and when we got back to the stables, they, they would ask us if we rode the horses because they were refreshed every time we brought them back. So, you know, we took care of them. So, but one day when we were coming back, uh, I took this one guy's horse. His name was, he was a Vietnam veteran. He came back from Vietnam. He was from Philadelphia. His name was Zimmerman. And um, he had an Appaloosa horse, and it was haughty spirited. And it just kept tromping its feet down like this, and its nose was flaring out. And I, he says, I can't ride horse. I said, well, take my horse. My horse is real gentle. You can have my horse. So I took his horse. So as we were coming back, this dog ran from behind the bushes underneath along the roadside. And my horse just walked right out in the middle of the road on his back legs. So I was reared up uh, in the air, and this car come up and hit the horse. And my, I, I flew off the horse, and my two legs went right into the windshield. Fortunately for the person that was sitting in the passenger seat, my shin right here hit, it's down just about four inches below my knee, hit the windshield and I flipped over the roof of the car and I landed on my spine on the, on the edge of the trunk and then I just rolled over onto the street. And my first thought was to get off the road because mm -hmm. I didn't want to get run over next. And so I went to stand up, but I couldn't stand up, so I crawled off to the side of the road. But both of my legs, from, my, from the upper thigh all the way down my ankle, were dark black and blue all the way up there. I broke some blood vessels or something in my legs, got battered. And then as I was flying in the air, it was like slow motion. It was like something you see in a movie. Mm -hmm. And my whole life passed in front of me. And I was telling my mother about some of the things I was thinking about. And I told her about these guys that were shooting arrows in these doors uh, at, at this housing place. And she says, I don't know how you remember that. You were only three years old, you know. And so, um, but I had a spinal cord injury and I had neuropathy uh, and, and shooting down my leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though, I, and, uh, you know, I tried to play ball and this stuff in the military, I had some problems with that even. And then, uh, before that even, I did play organized football. Mm -hmm. uh, out of two guys, uh, 200 people, we were doing 100 yard sprints, one after another, one after another. And a lot of guys were pulling up with uh, pulled hamstrings. Mm -hmm. I never had a pulled hamstring. And the reason why, because I used to run backwards a lot. So I would work out both of my muscles, my front mm -hmm. muscles and my back muscles. But like I said, I was real strong. So um, they, I, I was a wide receiver. And we had the third best team on, on, on the base. And if we would have had a better football, I mean, if we had a better quarterback, yeah. we would have been number one, I'm sure. So did uh, this back injury you received, did it, did it take you out of service at all? Or? No, it didn't. I just, um, I stayed in there. I, I learned how to tolerate pain, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I, I could tolerate pain. And um, like when I got my, I mean, I was not I was, I mean, I was upset that I got the splinter through my fingers and that really hurt and everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I figured, what are you going to do? And I, I had so many things happen to me. Uh, I even had, we were out in the field one time uh, practicing uh, night reconnaissance um, at Fort Carson. And um, we had blank guns, uh, M14s, and one of the guns blew up on me. So mm. some of the, I had my legs folded 
in a, in a folding position with my elbows and in a prone, I think they call it the prone position with your elbows down and the rifle out. And when it blew up, it blew out my legs like out to the side. And when I touched my legs with my hands, I, I couldn't feel my hands touching my legs. But I could feel my legs with my hands, mm -hmm. if, that, if you understand what I mean. And, um, and so after a little bit, then I start feeling this burning in my leg. And I had some strap metal right in the middle of my thigh on my mm -hmm. right side. Fortunately, that was the only thing that went in there. And it was like a, it was like a thick needle, that, but it went right in the muscle. And when I went to see the doctor, he said, don't worry, it'll work its way out. Well, it didn't come out for almost three years after I got out of the service. Mm. I was sitting there reading a the magazine, and I looked at my leg, and I felt something there. And I looked down, and I found a piece of metal. Uh, but he did he get a probe, and he put it in the same hole. And you could hear it clinking like this. Mm -hmm. And then they, were, they wanted to send me to Vietnam, uh, but my brother went over there before me, and... Um, I had, I had like orders from Fort Lewis to go there first. And then somebody I knew worked in the office, but then my orders got transferred and that's how I got to uh, Fort Carson. Uh, but then my brother went over there and he was in the engineers and they wanted to make him a lieutenant uh, because he worked for PennDOT, that's uh, the highway department of Pennsylvania. And he was a design draftsman and um, so he went over there, but he didn't want to go an extra year. They would have, he would have had to serve four years in the military uh, to go to officer's training school. Instead, he went to NCO training school, which is a three-year obligation. Mm -hmm. So he stayed in for three years, uh, but he went to Vietnam. Um, and so, um, and so, and so, and so uh, after, after I was at uh, Fort Carson, um, I was sent to Germany. and. I was in Artie Murphy's company, and that was the first of the 15 Third Infantry, and I was even in Artie Murphy's company. And even though I had a back injury and I had uh, uh, a torn cartilage when I was playing ball at Fort Carson, I tore a cartilage, and my whole thigh collapsed on me, and I couldn't stand for a long time. Mm -hmm. I had a cane, so I'd be put on light duty, but I wanted to try out for a tour team over there. You know, when you're young, like myself at that time, and you're strong, uh, you know, you'd sort of get over things, but then after a while, things would re recuperate, like, you know, uh, get worse again and then get better. So sometimes I had to go on light duty and things like that. So a f f Colonel in the Guard, when I got to, f to Germany, um, he, uh, he asked me to work in headquarters. And so he takes me on a tour. And I told him, I said, I wanted to, they, they had a team that was in Germany that, that was a full equipment team. It was an army team. Mm -hmm. And they had several teams over there that toured all of Europe. And so, um, so I, uh, I wanted to get on that team. So my orders came down. They misspelled my last name, I think intentionally. So I would have to work in headquarters. So I ended up working in headquarters. And I had to renovate the whole headquarters battalion. Now, because we weren't allowed to take work off the Germans, and these were old German barracks. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned about that was uh, when you tear out these walls, they didn't use like the lap boards, like the old construction. They used those, uh, like, those like they call them like a cat of nine tail or something, the things that grow out of the water. They were like tubes. And they were real about a quarter inch, and then they spaced them uh, uh, almost three sixteenths of an inch, and that's how when you put the plaster on that, it it, it goes behind there and it locks it in. Mm -hmm. But the nails were almost an inch long, and they were almost like needles, uh, pins, like mm -hmm. flat pins. And so, so I learned all that stuff about the construction there. So the Germans weren't allowed. Uh, we weren't allowed to take work off the Germans. So they remodeled the barracks there. But there weren't a lot of headquarters because of security there. And so you, I, I had to get a six clearance to work in headquarters. Uh, so when I was in there, um, like I said, the colonel took me around the whole uh, headquarters and took me in this one room. It's called the China Room. And they had 
all these different displays of helmets and awards that our allies gave us for helping during the wars. Uh, they were involved in all these wars. One of the, uh, the first of the 15 actually started in 1798. And, and it, uh, it was in the War of 1812 to 1815. It was in the Alamo Wars um, after Santa Anna, uh, you know, killed all our uh, people in, the, uh, in that war uh, uh, in, down in Texas, uh, the Alamo Wars. And then, uh, then it was in the four, four major uh, wars in the in, in the um, in the uh, in the Civil War, and I'll show you my hat because I got the pins right here. Okay, hold it up a little bit higher. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and this is the pin. This is the first of the fifteen. That's the third infantry. So this unit here, those four little acorns were four major battles in the Civil War. Then in the middle, you'll notice the dragon. That's from the Boxer Rebellion. There was a movie made, it was called 55 Days in Peking. That was it. And they even had some of the garments in the unit from there. And then they even had crossbows and different things like that. And then the, the middle of this pin, right above the dragon, is a gold mound. And that's called the Rock of the Mon. So when anybody meets uh, from this unit, they say Rock of the Mon. That was World War I, and the Germans were on one side of the river, and this 3rd Infantry unit was on the other side, and they stopped the Germans uh, from coming over. Uh, and, um, and if they wouldn't have done that, there was a possibility that Germans would have done better in the war. And, so, um, and then they were involved in World War II, and, that's, and I think they were involved in this, I'm pretty sure they were involved in the Spanish-American War, which is, I think, Right after World War One, uh, if I'm not mistaken, just before, just before, mm -hmm. and and, um, and so then Audie Murphy uh, came out of this unit, and uh, he tried to get in the Marines, but he was pretty small. I I always thought he was about five one, five two, something like that. But he turned out to be one of the best soldiers uh, in any military branch. And the and the Third Infantry has won forty awards. Uh, one of the mostly, high, it's the highest decorated unit mm -hmm. in, in any military branch. So the next highest is 16 awards. And Nani Murphy, um, um, he was a really good uh, soldier. So they have, when they have training for, for the guys uh, in the military, and, and they do exceptionally well in their training and things, and pass all their qualifications. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an Audie Murphy Award, especially for him. And I was down in uh, Texas in San Diego, I mean San Antonio, Texas, uh, for one of our unions, and they had the Audie Murphy Hospital down there. And it's a VA hospital, it's called the Audie Murphy Hospital. And they also help with uh, people with disability transportation. They help mm -hmm. with get transportation from the airport to that reunion. That was pretty neat down there. But anyway, going back, uh, to the military. So the colonel is still taking me through the barracks and he takes me in the one room and it's all these radios on both sides. There's two guys with headsets on. And so he goes, he, he takes me in there and they see these two guys sitting there and I'm thinking, what am I coming in here for? You know, there's nothing in here but these big radios along the walls and these guys were facing these like desks with these headsets on, writing stuff down. And he said, this is the only room you're not allowed in. So anybody that went in that room had to have a top, top secret clearance and above that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I, I seen them burning papers and what they would do, and I knew this because I was a printer, is when you, when you burn paper and there's print on it, the print turns white and the rest of it turns dark. So you could still, it's still legible uh, as far as you could read it still, even though it's burnt. And so what they had to do, they, they had these 55 gallon drums and they put the ashes in there and they had a handle and they would just turn that until it turned to complete ashes and then just crumble it all up. Uh, but it was pretty neat there. And so I, I went to the Germans that were working on the base. I was going back to that before. And um, they had some really nice baseboard that I needed for the, the colonel's room. Because I had to renovate the whole uh, colonel's room in that. 
So uh, I went over to the Germans, and a uh, little German that I talked, and a little English that they talked, we, we sort of communicated. They wanted to know what we called lumber and wood and stuff like that, and I told them, and they told me the German uh, phrase of what, you know, all that stuff. I, and I, I, I don't remember what they said, but, but uh, um, so they sold me baseboard, and I asked them what they wanted. So they gave me enough running foot to do uh, I, a, a room that was almost like 15 by 18. And uh, all they wanted was two cartons of cigarettes. So I went to the PX, got two cartons of cigarettes, and a, a carton of cigarettes then was $2.50 a carton. <laughs> so for five bucks, I got all this wood to do. And then they gave me a lieutenant and a, a, and a, uh, to help me with getting supplies and a sergeant. So this was before all this started. And I just remembered that. And so we drive into Germany, and he stops at, a, the, 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 the lieutenant stops at what they call a cafe, you know, German cafe, and say, come on, we'll have a beer. I wasn't much of a beer drinker or a drinker anyway. So we sit there, and so he wanted to talk about what, my, what I needed. So I told him what I needed and everything else, because uh, I kind of, looked at the room, I knew uh, what it looked like and all that, so uh, I got the supplies. But, and the sergeant was supposed to help me. And they had a guy before me when I got there, and he was in that one room for seven months, to, and he was still in the same room. I did the whole headquarters, every room that needed done, and mostly I worked in the colonel's room. And so where the windows were, and these were old, old German barracks, and this must have been the old German headquarters. And the windows were almost uh, 3 16th of an inch thick. They were real thick, mm -hmm. and they were long panes of windows, mm -hmm. and they were almost like uh, eight foot high. They're two panels or so across and almost eight foot high. And the, and the walls were real thick, too. Um, I would say they were uh, probably almost 18 inches thick, the walls. And so what I did across the one wall where they had the registers, the heating registers, I built the panel all the way across with a counter all the way across. And he had this really big, thick um, dictionary. And the dictionary was almost six, six, five to six inches thick. And it was pretty big. So I made a podium for his dictionary. And I, I, I secured it on that counter. And I opened the dictionary up. And I put one of the ribbons. It, had all, it was a really nice dictionary. And then... Uh, I went up to the, they had an artist that did a lot of the stuff on the base, like, mm -hmm. and I, I was an artist, but this guy, that's, this is all he did. He made the signs for the base, like for the units and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and he painted them, and he did all the lettering for them and that, and so I used, I talked to him, and any, anytime I needed some paints or something, he gave it to me. So from a combat infantry badge, which is three inches I did it, and it has to uh, reach across with the leaves and stuff. I made an exact replica and carved the rifle and painted the exact replica of uh, into three feet, from three inches to three feet. Uh, so I made a scale. So for every inch was a, a foot. And so, so I put it between our unit flag and the American flag behind his desk, and I hung it up on the wall. And I heard one of the sergeant majors took it home with him. I even signed it on the back. And I, I, I thought that was pretty bad because that was part of the unit. And I see some other uh, artwork from making the actual replica of the first of the 15 pin, this one here. And I thought that I could have done a better job uh, than that. And I just don't have the time because I'm I do a lot of stuff with the veterans and their families and stuff, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm on about 12 or so committees, and mm -hmm. um, you know, um, but anyway. Um, when you were in Germany, you mentioned um, that they brought wounded from the Seven Day War. Can I, tell me a little bit about that. What was going well, on? Uh, well, that, yeah, when we were there, um, one day, um, all this, I mean, we didn't have many jeeps and stuff moving around on on the base you know and there was one road going in to the base in front of the headquarters mm -hmm. and which uh, base was this again 
It was uh, in uh, Kitzigan, Germany. Okay. Well, uh, they called it Bad Kitzigan. It was just uh, south, uh, southeast of Würzburg. And Würzburg is where the 3rd Infantry Headquarters was, supposedly. And so when we got down there, uh, uh, when we were in the base, uh, all of a sudden, all of these jeeps and all these people were running all over the place. They were canceling orders, and then they had these big, uh, all these, we had an airfield there. So all these planes start coming in, one after another. All these big cargo planes start coming in, one after another. And I think about 32 planes come in. And we were, they called it Harvey Barracks. We were up on this hill from the base, and you could see in the hangar from the top of the hill, and they just lined up all these uh, folding carts, cots, so the, the people coming in could sleep there. And then they had duffel bags beside each one of them. And uh, there was hundreds of them. And so what it was was the metal vac planes uh, because the War of 1812 had started then. Uh, the I mean, uh, I'm sorry, it was the war, uh, Seven Day seven War. war yeah. It was the Seven Day War. And that was the war between um, Israel and Jordan. And so we were sort of allies with both sides, too. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure if we were going down there, we were probably better allies with, um, uh, with Israel than we were with jo Jordan uh, beca because of some of the religious factors and what happened to the Jewish people during World War II and that. And so they, you know, I thought that we tried to protect them more in, in certain ways. But uh, to be in, the, in the, all fairness, I thought that their, our job uh, as the United States military and helping, we would probably have helped uh, both sides in that situation. And so the, the, everybody that was supposed to leave ETS out of the base, all their orders were canceled. And so, uh, and so everybody was all worried but in three days, everybody started packing up and they left. And so we thought that was the end of it. And about another day later, all these planes came back in again. <laughs> and uh, they only stayed there another day. And then by that time, the war is finally over. That's why they call it the Seven Day War. Mm -hmm. But that was a lot of involvement, uh, trying to get ready, trying to help out with all that stuff and that, and then closing the base stop. Uh, oh yeah, and then uh, I, I was one of the fastest swimmers in my city, in the city of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. I didn't swim in high school, but I did swim in junior high school. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when we were there uh, in Germany, they had an Olympic-sized pool, but it was on the island on the river. And so you had to go across the bridge. And so I was a real good diver. Uh, doing all the tricks, but I could dive off the high dives and all that stuff. But I used to go swimming mostly to keep in shape and all that. And, and that was really neat to see all that stuff over there. And, and the town of uh, Kitzigan reminded me a lot of Pittsburgh because they had the, uh, Belgian uh, stones in the streets and stuff. And also when I was there, I was there for the Oktoberfest. And that was really, really neat to see. Because they celebrated not only in town, but they celebrated on the base. So one of the challenges they had, some of the soldiers had, was to fill their helmets up with beer, set them on a counter, and put their hands behind their back. And without using their hands or anything else, they had to drink out of the helmets. They had to drink the beer out of the helmets. Mm. And so, so they would put in town, but they would put these big tents up, and they had platforms, and they had people playing musical instruments, and everybody would donate, come in and bring food in. And it was a big celebration. It was really neat to see that. Mm -hmm. Now, we have the same thing here. We have the Oktoberfest in the United States. I live in a small community, and uh, we have a, uh, the Apple Festival and all the communities around where I live in southwestern Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They have the Apple Festival. They have the Peach Festival, the Pumpkin Festival, just about any harvest festival that you can think of in a lot of the uh, communities all over the country mm -hmm. that uh, do that. They, they all had stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh. So you, um, you're with the Disabled American Veterans Organization and you hold several leadership positions, have done a, a lot of advocacy work for, for veterans. 
Um, tell me a little bit about how you became a member of the group and you were injured while you were serving in the military. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so uh, like I said, I was playing football and I, I got an injury to my knee. It was a torn cartilage mm -hmm. and it collapsed my whole thigh muscle. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't stand on my leg for quite a long time. And then when I had the car accident, um, like I said, my legs were battered and they didn't send me or take me to the hospital. So I went to an outside doctor. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, he, he said that was dangerous. And what he did, he gave me cotton and wrapped my uh, legs with cotton and then he put ace bandages around them, my mm -hmm. both my legs, and told me to keep my legs elevated. I, I, I still have uh, some of the residual effects in my legs, mm -hmm. discoloring in my legs uh, from that incident, mm -hmm. uh, but I never got any type of benefits for that particular part. Mm -hmm. I only got uh, benefits for, for my lower spine. It did hurt my back. Mm -hmm. I've had four lower back surgeries. Right and I have neuropathy in my right leg. I also have a, bla a bladder problem from nerve damage, but I never got benefits for that. And so um, I came up with ideas to make sure our veterans um, could be taken care of. One of the things I think is no veteran in this country should ever have a need. And so I figured out how ways the government doesn't necessarily have to pay for that. So what I thought it, as a country uh, if you, you, everybody would have to donate a dollar. Uh, so when you, when you, uh, if you're in certain states, they ask you if you want to donate, when you turn in your license, they want to donate a dollar. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see the money going to veterans organizations that really help the veterans in their needs. And one of the worst things um, uh, I found out in, in some of the systems was to make, uh, to prosthetics department mm -hmm. um, you know uh, if you if you have a broken prosthetics you 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 need a system right away if you have a broken scooter or wheelchair you need assistance right away and so I always give them ideas on uh, how they can do that have extra chairs so so somebody's chair breaks or some to have an extra one <clears throat> not for every veteran but have some spare ones that they can uh, give veterans uh, to use uh, while they get their um, their scooters or wheelchairs or other devices fixed and I think that would go a long way because if you can't get the stuff done then you really the freedom that you served your country for you actually lose that freedom that you that everybody else has in this country but you don't have it and you're a veteran who served for that freedom and that, that really so I I figured out how ways we could pay for it. Like I said, in Pennsylvania, when you pay for your license, they ask you if you want to donate a mm -hmm. dollar to this charity or something. Mm -hmm. So if everybody d gave, you know, mandatory a dollar uh, when they pay their income tax, that money will go to veterans organizations in their states, and it will fulfill those needs that veterans, particularly uh, certain injuries, and then with housing. So I designed. I know how to design houses. I'm on the Regional Planning Committee mm -hmm. for uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a 10 county area. I'm on the panel participation board. Mm -hmm. So I actually designed a whole mall complex. I called it the Live and Do Everything Mall. But I also came up with ideas for uh, building these houses uh, for veterans, not only disabled veterans, but for a lot of veterans. And I even talked to an international corporation who is interested in funding the program. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, every time I turn around, something, ha something happens to me, uh, like last year, uh, not last year, but the year before my wife got uh, stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So I went through that and she just retired from nursing 41 years mm -hmm. and she worked in the wound care for, uh, she worked at uh, this one particular hospital called St. Clair Hospital. It's in, uh, in, like Scott Township, Mount Lebanon mm -hmm. area of Pittsburgh, and she was one of the staff nurses there, and she um, uh, she she worked med surgical diabetes, and she took care of just about everybody that in her family that needed help with anything. You know, mm -hmm. she's a pretty smart uh, girl, and then she was like uh, like I said, a staff nurse there. So uh, then the last 14 years or so, she worked in the wound care. 
and she worked with a really prestigious doctor. His name was Dr. Steed. He uh, was a vascular surgeon, worked at the University of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. in wound care research. And then he went into practice for a while and used some of the practices that he helped develop to save people who had diabetes from losing their limbs and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But now he retired from practice again, went back into research, and now they're working with all the stem cells and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so he's actually, some of his uh, treatment uh, uh, care has been written in medical books mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, so, uh, so far uh, my wife had her treatments and she's uh, in remission. And um, wonderful. Yeah, and, and so I, I think within the next, I mean, they're almost at the verge of curing breast cancer. And they're almost they're at the verge of cur uh, curing a lot of different cancers. And with this new stem cell re research and all that, uh, there's always something new coming up. Someone always perfects mm -hmm. a new way to, to uh, do mm -hmm. these procedures and stuff to shorten uh, the length of time of uh, health and stuff like that. And they've been saving a lot of people. And a lot of this stuff is really. Uh, has been learned on the battlefield uh, mm -hmm. from soldiers that were severely injured. Uh, they have this powder actually that you could put on a wound. A and, quick clot. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> they had that, but they also had the stem cell stuff. I've seen a thing on a documentary or uh, mm -hmm. something on 60 Minutes about somebody lost almost um, 45 or 35 or so percent of the muscle mass in their right thigh from a IUD explosion or something, mm -hmm. and they put that powder on them uh, with the stem cell. My wife worked with that mm -hmm. through Dr. Steed, and they actually got, got up, almost up to 95% of strength back in that muscle again. Wow. And so there's amazing things going on in the medical field. And there's even uh, places in Pittsburgh that are starting to work with uh, developing organs and things for people. Mm -hmm. and. Um, some of this stuff, I think they're working with uh, the, where they don't need to have rejection medicines mm -hmm. because they can use your, your, your DNA and, and, and insert it in, into these organs and it comes, becomes part of you. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting too. So there's a lot of that stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, sir, I want to thank you for your service on many fronts, for your work in the military yeah. as well as your work with the disabled uh, American veterans. So yeah. It's, uh, very laudable. So yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I'd just like to say, um, I wanted to start with my grandfather. My father, my uncle Dominic, and uh, my grandfather all came here in 1915. Mm -hmm. And they served in, uh, my, my grandfather worked in the coal mines. They came here in 18, uh, I mean, uh, 15, 1915. Uh, and, and and my grandfather got a job in the coal mines. Well, World War I started, and I think he had, he had to go back. And I think he was a prisoner of war uh, while he was over there. And uh, also, um, he had some problems. He was hit with mustard gas, mm -hmm. I remember. And I remember going to see him at the VA hospital in Pittsburgh and um, when I was real young, and it really laid an impression on me. So. Um, and once in a while he'd have these spells where he had coughing spells mm -hmm. and it's a hard time to breathe. So he, he, um, he passed away. He was almost homeless. We had to move him in our house for a while. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle Dominic served in the Army Air Corps and I, I'm pretty sure he served in the Battle of the Bulge and I think my uncle John did too. And, but my dad was in the 1st Army Air Corps and he was down in Florida or somewhere because I, he, he, I have a picture of him and there's palm trees. Mm -hmm. And then when I found out the 1st Army Air Corps was down by Tampa. Mm -hmm. And so a friend of mine worked at the base down there for 41 years. He was in charge of maintenance. Well, his father was the lead fighter pilot for Doolittle when he went to the European Theater. Mm -hmm. So he flew out of Africa, I believe, with the P-51 Mustangs, which they developed the tanks made them bigger so uh, that they could fly the full mission. And so, I, and I met some of the Tuskegee Airmen too. Mm. So going back to my family, so uh, my uncle Jimmy, he f served in Korea, and I don't know if he, if he uh, 
was in combat or not. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I don't know the whole history about him. But my two brothers and I were all in during the Vietnam War. And my, uh, like I said before, my brother went, one brother went to Vietnam. But my other brother, because we were all tall, they had him in a lineup that on a federal building and they were picking guys that were taller guys and said, you're a Marine, you're a Marine, you're a Marine. So all the other guys were going to the Army, but they were selecting taller guys to go to the Marines. So my youngest brother, John, he went to Okinawa and my other brother went to Vietnam and I went to Germany. We all ended up in the States. And, we'll, and then my, some of my best friends I went to school with. One of my best friends was the 1st Air, uh, Air Mobile Cavalry. His name is Jack Dank. He, him and I, uh, we used to go to all these dances when we were young. Everybody knew us. I was a really good dancer. I have a friend who was in Greece on Broadway, second lead. And so uh, he always used to tell me, he said, you ought to go to New York, man. You could go on Broadway. But he, uh, he was with the Civic Light Opera in Pittsburgh, and he did a lot of shows there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in the top six actors. And so Audrey Previn was the director, too, of the Pittsburgh Symphony, and he wrote scores for My Fair Lady, Oklahoma, and was married to Mir Farrow. And he used to call me Junior. Everybody calls me Junior. And so, um, so those are uh, some of the things. But my one bu buddy that was in Vietnam, Jack, he, uh, he, he uh, when he was over there, he, he started off as an E3, and um, he went from E3 to E6 in one year. He got wounded twice. He had uh, two Purple Hearts, uh, two uh, Bronze Stars, one with a letter of valor. Usually when you get a letter of valor, you're supposed to move up to the Silver Star. Mm. And uh, he never did that. But I, I think I heard stories that were similar to his story. Because when he was in Vietnam one night, he, sa he said he used to sleep in uh, like a fender of a vehicle up off the ground. He didn't like sleeping on the ground. And so... And so he had, to, he had to go to the latrine at night. And while I was there, going there, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, he seen a silhouette of a Vietnamese that, who infiltrated the camp. And he, he, just, he had his automatic weapon with him. He just kind of mowed him down right there, and this big fight ensued. And so he seen where they were coming in. He had a fragment grenade launcher, mm -hmm. and he kept hitting that one spot and knocking a lot of them guys out. He said to me, he said, a lot of these guys uh, that, uh, he, that were in his unit, uh, they evacuated. He didn't, ever, he didn't know if they died or if they were wounded, what happened to them. But they, I think they, they knocked off about uh, almost 90 Vietnamese in that big, uh, so, and that was the fifth of the, of the first cavalry that he, he was in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he had, he had a little bit of shrap metal wound uh, during that pursuit. And um, uh, so he's, uh, to me, he's a national hero. I actually thought, because I heard stories about people uh, going through the same thing and saving people's lives, which he, off, he, he for sure did. I thought he should have received the letter of, con I mean, the, uh, uh, the National uh, Honor. You Medal know, of Honor. Medal of Honor, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't notice until a couple of years ago, about four or five years ago, we had a reunion with the 3rd Infantry down in Savannah. We went on a tour to one of the carriers, the old carriers mm -hmm. that's along the Savannah River. And there's actually three different Medal of Honors. One's for the Navy, mm -hmm. and the Navy one is the same one the Marines get. And then there's one for the Air Force now, mm -hmm. and there's one for the Army. So that was pretty interesting seeing that, mm -hmm. too. And so they did change a lot of the uh, insignias of the military. I always liked the original insignia, which is the same insignia of the President of the United States. Hmm. That was the first, one of the first Army ones when the I was seal. there. Yeah. yeah, seal. So uh, anyway, uh, so now I, after uh, my one brother, uh, nephew uh, on my sister's side, I, he served, in, I think he served in the same uh, unit in, in uh, Kitchigan after I was out a long time ago. He works in construction now. Uh, and then my other nephew, he's still in the Air Force. I, I believe he should be at E8, E9 now. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was with the 9-11 in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And they closed that unit down and uh, he got sent down to near Savannah. And now he just moved on to um, 
Florida. Mm. But uh, he was over in Iraq, Afghanistan, and over in Europe for quite a long time, back and forth. But what they do now is he's like a civilian worker, but he has to wear his uniform. But if you're in the States, you only get a half a point. If you're overseas, then you get a full point. And so he has to stay in the military to earn his full retirement. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that's fair. I think every day you should count as a military. Because even though you're not uh, fighting, you're still protecting this country because you're backing up the people that are fighting and either getting wounded or getting killed. You're backing those people up. And when people were in Germany and Korea and South Korea and in Germany, mm -hmm. we stopped war from continuing to happen and stop war. And, and look at where we're at now and all the peace in the world that we have. We spent $3 trillion between $2 trillion in Iraq and one, or I think $1 trillion in Afghanistan. Uh, but we only spent, uh, I think the budget for the VA uh, this year is about 69, uh, was $69 billion, but I think it's now $89 billion. And so when we get to uh, Washington, D.C., we, we try to fulfill more of the needs, so we might ask them for another $5 billion mm -hmm. uh, for the programs we need. And the DAV has been really responsible uh, and with a lot of the other organizations uh, in getting a lot of these benefits, the Caretakers Act for veterans and stuff. Uh, but what really up upsets me the most is the, the Navy veterans who served over in, in uh, the blue waters of Vietnam and, I, and even though they got their ribbons for being uh, active in those wars, they were considered the blue water. And they're going by the ships they were on, mm -hmm. and they're going by the uh, areas they were in, uh, 12 nautical miles off the coast, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or perimeter, as they say, mm -hmm. which the perimeter might be seven miles. So, uh, but every time I hear something about it, it's, something's always different. Yeah. The, the, the mileage or something like that. And so it took them 50 years to pass that. And some of these guys were getting benefits uh, because of their income. Now, I wrote a proposal years ago because I thought that the VA was getting overwhelmed by veterans. Mm -hmm. I, I actually thought that they should privatize a lot of the services so that more veterans could get the treatment they need. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, one of the ways uh, that we can raise the money to provide these services is through everybody. Because we didn't serve, uh, we didn't serve like a district. We served the country. We mm -hmm. served the whole world. We serve everywhere. And because we do that, we protect not only our country and our civilians, we tr protect a lot of people around the world mm -hmm. constantly, you know. Absolutely. And so if we can't take care of these people that do that, then there's something wrong with this country. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things we got to do. But these Navy veterans, like I said, some of these Navy veterans were getting benefits because of their income. And now they did a means test. Now, I, I think that's unconstitutional because when I went into service, there was, there was nothing about a means test. I thought if a veteran was making a lot of money and had could get insurance, that, his maybe some of his insurance, but I never thought that they would should take anything off a veteran because uh, it's not making his life better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and as a taxpayer, all these ta people paying taxpayer, you can't get assistance in this country unless you lose everything. Mm -hmm. I think they should help you get back into society. Mm -hmm. So the thing I wrote was have these out, outside hospitals or treatment centers. Uh, for veterans that de didn't need emergency care or immediate care or specialized mm -hmm. care, and they start doing that. And in my county, we've had four hospitals, uh, um, one of uh, these clinics, and so they kept growing. And now they got one that's really big. They just brought a dietitian in there. Uh, they brought uh, um, hearing, and there's supposed to be uh, eyeglasses in there too. But the other thing is, um, and then they brought a podiatry uh, people in there. And so that saves the main hospital from having uh, so many people going in there. Mm -hmm. And the eye clinic is so backed up, you could sit there for three or four hours just waiting to go see somebody. So 
I thought that was a good thing that they transfer some of the services to these small branches in the outside communities of the main hospital. And, you know, we're, we're talking over three to 5,000 people working at these facilities. And these people are paid to take care of us. Mm -hmm. And then they're denying us better uh, benefits in a lot of ways and lying about our health. And the worst thing you could do for anybody, whether they're a veteran or not, is not to tell them the truth and take care of their condition exactly. in a timely manner. And if they would do that, they would save billions of dollars in health care and make sure uh, that these veterans would take be taken care of. So there's a lot to be said, there's a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. And our organization, along with top, some of the top guys that oversee some of the cases, uh, Jim Marslack is one of the top guys that oversee the cases mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was in my chapter, he's a good friend of ours. And uh, Scott Hope, and then we just lost another good guy, his name was Jeremy Yates, and uh, he came to Washington too. And uh, some of the other guys, uh, Dave, um, uh, I think I'm going to forget his name. Uh, anyway, uh, Dave, and, and I have a lot of gratitude for our service officers that work here and all the service officers. But, uh, you know, the, uh, with all the technology, this is another thing. With all the technology we have, some of these guys, you can't even call our office. You should be able to call the office, and they should have an answer machine there. Mm -hmm. And if someone calls, they should get back to them within so much time. Now they want you to wire, I mean, to uh, go on the computer and do everything in the computer. A lot of these senior citizens and guys that never had education that don't know how to do that, myself included. I knew some of that stuff. I'm pretty uh -huh. good with my cell phone and all that. But for all those guys, so they're missing out on treatment and the care and, and the benefits that they earned. And to me, that's, that's a b bad thing. So mm -hmm. those are, there's so many things that we have to look at mm -hmm. uh, in taking care of our veterans. And if everybody helped and participating and helping with their remodeling their houses, helping them with ex accessibilities in their houses and that, mm -hmm. like I said, no veteran should have a need and that's how we could fulfill the needs of veterans if everybody uh, devoted some of their time and, and some of their uh, contributions to help these veterans and their families. Thank you. Well put, my friend, well put. Thank you so much for your time and your service. Thank you.